Good morning, everyone. Here we are again, another Sunday morning. Praise the Lord. I'm Pastor Jan Osminski, again here with my husband, Pastor Mike Ozzy Osminski, and we are from Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. We welcome all that are watching, and if you turn on later, we welcome you. Um, this is the portion of our service where I open up in prayer and I just then give a really short communion exhortation. So if you want to get something like a piece of bread or something to drink for communion, that would be great. So let me open in prayer first. Okay, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to join together, to be in one accord, to be willing participants of hearing your holy word and letting that word go deep into our hearts. Dear Jesus, thank you for all you did and that you're doing and that you will continue to do. Lord, I pray for those that don't know you. I pray for those that are sick in our body. I pray for all those that have gone astray and I pray that they return. So dear Jesus, this morning, may your spirit reign May you open our eyes and may we see you, open our ears that we may hear you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, well we are on Psalm 146 and we're gonna, I'm going to read it first and then I'm going to go back and make some comments. Page, page 851 in my Bible. Psalm 146, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Well, I guess he wants to praise the Lord, doesn't he? Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. In spe His spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord, his God who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and the widow. But the way of the wicked he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations, praise the Lord. Well, you know, I would just read the Psalms and go, that's really awesome. I'm going to praise the Lord. I know God is awesome. He made everything. Hallelujah. But now that I'm reading the Psalms and, and, and really... uh. I want to say thank you to Pastor for really showing so much about the Psalms. The Psalms are nice songs of praise and worship, and sometimes they're songs of lament. But but what went behind this Psalm? Why did David write this Psalm? Well, when I investigated, I found out that probably around this time, David was running for his life. His son Absalom was after him. Now, let me back up a little bit. If you remember the story, um, David's one son, his firstborn, uh, raped a, his, his half-sister, Tamar. And it was Absalom's whole sister. And David really didn't do anything. And for two years, so Absalom, for two years, let that fester. He just let that anger fester in his heart that his father didn't defend his sister. He didn't do anything. So Absalom decided to have a party and he invited all his brothers to the party. And he ordered his servant to kill the brother Amnon who raped Tamar. Tamar. And David was so upset. He was so upset. See, at that point, I think, and, and you, you can decide for yourself, but I think David was one of maybe one of was one of those guys that just if I ignored it, it'll go away. I'm not gonna deal with what Amnon did to his half sister. It was wrong, but you know, it's over, it's okay. Well it wasn't okay. 
And the thing that we have to remember, our God is a just God. Now, how God would have handled that, you know, I don't believe he would have killed Amnon. But Absalom was so angry, he let that anger just fest until he solved it his way. So then what happens, Absalom takes off. He's afraid for his life. But while he's gone, he's talking smack about his dad. He's saying awful things. And he's building up uh, support. A lot of people now are for him. A lot of people are defecting from David and they're joining Absalom. And David hears about this. And before long, Absalom's coming to attack his father. So what does David do? He runs. And he runs with just a small band of followers. And then during that time, um, David prays for mercy for his son. And he has ordered his men to not kill him, no matter what. And when I read that, I thought to myself, he really has a father's heart. He really has a father's heart. And so... When we read this, we we hear David crying out, crying out that he's going to praise God for as long as he lives. And he has no idea how long that could be. And he's saying, I'm not going to put my trust like in Absalom or people. Now, the thing about Absalom, he was really good looking. I guess he had hair that weighed five pounds and he was supposed to be something. And so he was all about how it looked, how he act. I guess he had a chariot that was out of this world. And you know, Absalom was one of those that wanted people to trust in him, not in God. And and David says, do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. You see, and that's what's going on in this world. People are fighting because who they're going to trust, what man they're going to trust. We need to trust only in God. Because it says right in here, his spirit departs, he returns to the earth. In that day, his plans perish. Now, the verse 5, I think, is very interesting. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Now, Jacob has a funny little story, too. Jacob, well, he was a twin. His his brother, his twin brother was Esau, and And Esau was born first, and so he would get the inheritance. And boy, oh boy, Jacob didn't like that. Jacob wanted it all. So he, his mother helped him. He put a disguise on, uh, pretended he was Esau, and his father granted him the inheritance. Well, Esau wasn't happy about that. They had some words. Uh, Jacob took off. 20 years, he was gone. He was with Laban, and then... um, And then he's going to meet his brother. And his brother has a huge, a huge army of men with him. And so Jacob gets scared and he runs. But he can't get very far because the angel of the Lord finds him. And he says to him, you need to go back and meet your brother. And he says, no, I'm afraid. And so they wrestle. And he's, and finally the angel says, let me go. And he says, if you bless me, I will, I will let you go. And so, guess what? God's always one step ahead of us. He, he blessed him, but he wounded him in his, in his hip. And so he always walked with a limp as a reminder of, really, who is God? And Jacob, of course, had a great uh, reconciliation with his brother. So when you think of God of Jacob, think of, God of the covenant or God of the wrestling prayer. I like that. Um, so we have two things going on here. We hear about Absalom. We hear about, you know, and, and I think um, God's making a point. You can wrestle with him, but he's ultimately going to win. He won with Jacob. He, he won. The end of the story for Absalom, he was killed. Even though David ordered him not to be killed. He was killed by Joab, and um, David was heartbroken. He, he, just, he just was heartbroken. Now, the other thing I want to mention is this. Um, you know, we do have a lot of poor. 
there's always been a lot of poor in the world. And in the Torah, it says, I, I found this is pretty interesting. The, the, the Lord um, set it up so um, people that owned property, harvest fields, would leave the edges of the fields unharvested, unharvested for the poor. And, and there was also a provision in the Torah that said that if you had a, a relative that was struggling, it was your duty to help them. And I think that it's, it's very interesting because in this world we live in right now, it's all about my needs. It's all about, well, that's not fair. Why should I have to pay out of my check for those people to get money? Why is it fair that they get free food? And et cetera, and et cetera. And see, God doesn't want us to feel that way. He wants us to give out of the abundance that we have. You know, the Lord's, the Lord, the more you pour out of yourself, the more he loves you. You know that? The more the Lord sees that you are empty, he can fill. So it's not about creating a, a pile of wealth. It's not about um, creating a kingdom like Absalom wanted. It's not even about you carving out your justice for where you think you've been wronged. It's up to God. It's up to God. So this, this psalm uh, really is reminding us to praise him. Always praise him. Always bless him. And in doing that, he will give us, he will give us support. It may not be immediate. It might not be the way we think, but he will do it. He is the God of Jacob. You know, God doesn't even care that we wrestle with them sometimes. He doesn't even mind. You go toe-to-toe with him. What he cares about is that there's reconciliation between the wrestling, that it comes to finally where you say, okay, I cry, uncle. You, I, I get it now. So it's important to remember in this hour not to pledge allegiance to any man. Men die. Their dreams die. You know, I was thinking about this in the 70s. There was some uh, upheaval. There were um, protests going on against the Vietnam War. There were protests of civil rights going on. Uh, women were um, beginning to get um, some equality in the workplaces. Um, and then all of a sudden it kind of smoothed out. Do you notice? And now it's resurging again. Now we're seeing um, people crying out against injustice. People saying, wait a minute, it's been 400 years, 400 years since slavery and how little we've accomplished. We're seeing where God um, is allowing these things to come to the surface. And I, I really believe that we cannot turn to man for solutions. We need to turn to God. And we need to ask God, what is it I can do? What is it I can do? You know, one other thing I just want to say is I fortunately grew up where there's very little distress in my life. And and I think a lot of my friends lived in that same position. And now with COVID, oh my gosh, they're screaming, screaming, screaming. And what are they screaming? They want things back to normal. They want things, to, they want their kids in school. They want to go out and have parties. They want to do this and that. And COVID doesn't care what they want. I think in this hour, we need to realize that God is on the throne. God is, I really think that God is calling us all to our knees, is calling us all to go back to our first love, to, to really give up all this stuff about bigger houses and nicer cars and, and all that, and to really go to him. I have abundance. What can I do with it? I have um I know the Lord. What should I do with it? Here, and here's just a little story. 
my husband walks the dog every day and and the people in the neighborhood are beginning to recognize him and he has little chats when he walks and um my dog Fitz met a girlfriend yesterday named uh, Gretchen who's another long-haired dachshund but my husband you know is just talking to the lady and making a friend and I just thought to myself we need to open ourselves and start being Jesus we need to Jesus was so welcoming to everybody and you know what else I thought I know I'm kind of um going all over the place but all those people he healed they don't have names you ever think about that the blind man the lady with the issue of blood the the lepers that they don't have they're nameless you see, God wants us to empty ourselves. He wants us to take on Him. They were nameless, and hopefully they went on to represent Jesus, to be Jesus to a world. He wants us to be nameless but representing Him. And I don't mean that in a, a way like we can't have our, an identity. I don't mean that. But I mean He wants us to empty out and be filled with Him. Well, that's, that's all I want to say today. I want us to praise the Lord. It started with praise the Lord. It ends with praise the Lord. Again, if you read a psalm, you have to do some research on it because it is not just a song. There's a background to it. You know, poor David. Can you imagine? Somebody wants you dead. That's bad enough. But your own child wants you dead? Your own child is spewing out horrible things about you. Can you imagine the heartbreak that man felt? And yet we do that. We do that to God lots of times. I, I feel like we, we curse him. We, we don't look to him. We look to other solutions. Can you imagine how you feel sometimes? So anyway, I, I feel like I'm scattered, but I feel like... Um, God really wants you to seek his face and open your heart and push things aside. And we have so many hours in our day. Not like it used to be, probably when Jesus lived. They had to work, get their own food, cook their own food, do all these things. And we have countless free hours. But yet, what do we do with them? So anyway, Lord, I just want to... Thank you again. There's there's symbolism in here of you, of your death, your resurrection, of your selfless love. So selfless. And Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that that you that you died for us, that you made a way for us. Otherwise we would not be sitting here. We would not be. So help us to stay to go to you and not get caught up in the world. What man can save me? We're looking to you, Jesus. And I really believe that this hour was created so that we would go back to our first love, so we would we would go to you, God, and not rely on our own strength, not rely on what we can do or what we can do and how great we are. Look at what I can do, but rather to look to you. So thank you for your body, dear Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord, again, for your precious, precious blood. Thank you, dear Lord, for just going to that cross and not even thinking how awful it would be, but willing no matter what. Even though you knew it was going to be bad, you still went through with it. Lord, help us to see that and help us also to do the same, Lord. Do not give up. Not to say this is too hard. I'm going to back to my fishing like I did before I met Jesus. In the boat, I'm going to go fishing. And Jesus knew where to find, find those disciples. He knew where they would be. Jesus knows where you will be. Jesus always knows where to find you. He's there. So in your hour of distress... Cry out and say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, stay tuned for, my dog just dropped the plate. 
Stay tuned for part two of our Sunday morning. God bless you. Have a good day. Good morning. Okay. Let's get, let me get set up here. All right. Well, I realize we have been teaching on the prophetic nature of the church since September. We've been looking at the handout that um, we put out on the website and started teaching from at that time. We've added to it an addenda, uh, several issues, and I've uh, also taught from one of those issues. I spent the last three weeks teaching on the unveiling of Jesus to commission the Revelation 1 apostolic ministry and prophetic ministry in the church. It is a ministry that God grants to be raised up among his people in times of great trouble and difficulty. And obviously, that's where we're at. Uh, we've also been teaching on the prophetic nature of the Psalms. And um, I want to look along those same lines today uh, at this idea of the Lord revealing himself as he truly is to us. And when he reveals who he truly is to us, he commissions us for a mission, apostolic, prophetic mission. He raises up his leaders to disciple his people, to uh, equip the saints for the work of the ministry and to build up the body of Christ. Now, on Wednesday nights, we have a Bible study. And uh, several of us share. And this past Wednesday... Teresa Vandervest shared on Jesus' walking on the water in Matthew 14. It was phenomenal. In fact, I'm going to steal it from her. Uh, I'm going to start in Matthew 14 and then attempt to tie that into Exodus chapter 3 uh, for reasons that hopefully will, will be seen as we read. So, Father, as we look at at your word, Lord. We've, we've heard Pastor Jan share out of the Psalms and draw into that the life of David and the life of Jacob, Lord, and apply it to our situation, Lord. We want to look at the life of Jesus' disciples when he was training them and raising them up in the earth, and we want to look at the call of Moses as well, again, to apply it to our time and situation in Jesus' name. Amen. So Teresa had gotten this word earlier in the year and was, was, was planning to share it, never got a chance to share it, uh, decided to share it this past Wednesday night at the Zoom Bible study, and it was powerful. It, it impacted me tremendously. I've been trying to work Exodus 3 almost every week into what I've been sharing and haven't been able to, and I felt this would uh, tru truly give me a chance. Now, this is the story of Jesus walking on the water. And what the, the background to Jesus walking on the water, and we're in Matthew 14. First of all, Herod put John the Baptist to death at the start of Matthew 14. Matthew 14, verses 1 through 12, discuss that. And verse 13 speaks of Jesus' reaction. You, you know, I mean, John was Jesus' angel, Jesus' messenger, the one that he sent before his face to prepare his way. John the Baptist was Jesus' first pastor, John the Baptist baptized Jesus. They go back to childhood. They were cousins. And uh, John was born a few months before 
Jesus was. They were very close in age, same family. And so Jesus took his death hard, as one might be expected. He died as a martyr, but he took it hard. In verse 13 of Matthew 14 says, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. He went out in the wilderness. John was a man of the wilderness. He taught Jesus. He modeled for Jesus how to seek the face of the Lord uh, in prayer in the wilderness. Jesus honors his memory by simply following the practices that John imparted to Jesus. Uh, and um, he withdrew uh, from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. All this activity is, is taking place around the Sea of Galilee. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he came back ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, and basically they say, look, you've been teaching, you've been healing. And, and we see two of the three major aspects of Jesus's ministry for the three and a half years uh, that he, he uh, walked in his calling, in his fivefold calling, and that was he healed the sick, cast out demons, that's just another aspect of healing. He taught, and then we'll see the third aspect of his ministry in the, the final part of this chapter. But the disciples say they've, they've been with you all day, Lord. They're in this desert place. They need food, and of course we know the story. Jesus feeds the 5,000 miraculously. Um, there's a There was a... a a provision of five loaves of bread and two fish, and Jesus multiplied it in order to feed, as verse 21 says, 5,000 men besides women and children. It's, it's called the feeding of the 5,000, but it's the feeding of way more than 5,000. 5,000 is the, the men. Men were the basis of the, the numbering, um, but you know, every man here or majority of these men had wives and they didn't just have one or two children. They, these were large families. So we, we know that. Uh, we know that the, the numbers would have been up, upward of 15, 20,000 that Jesus would have fed miraculously. So that brings us, that gives us the context to the story that Teresa plugged into. And we're going to start in verse 22 and share a number of the things she shared. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. Again, Jesus starts this in prayer by himself, ministers powerfully, sends the disciples away and goes back and prays. And, and again, if we want to understand the secret of Jesus' anointing, the secret of his apostolic fivefold ministry, prayer. He's constantly, he's praying. He's praying through the night. He's seeking the Father's face. He wants to see what the Father's doing and hear what the Father's saying. And that informs him and that empowers him to do his ministry and we've talked about that from john uh, the gospel of john chapter 5 verses 19 and 20 and 30 and 31 this is the strength of jesus's ministry teresa points out that the disciples going on ahead of, of jesus by themselves on the boat again this is all surrounding the the sea of galilee and they're traveling by boat from location to location rather than by land. It's, it's normally faster by boat. So they're in obedience. Jesus is in obedience, and they're obeying Jesus. And then it says in verse 24, But the boat by this time was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. What, what happens, and these are trained fishermen, they're 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 trained seafarers. They, they understand how to get from one place to another. 
a great storm arises. And as this storm arises, the wind is against them. And as hard as they're, they're rowing and, and pushing to get from point A to point B, the wind is blowing them off course. And they're getting further and further off course. The wind is against them. The wind is, is, is in opposition to them. Now, you need some background here. We need, we need a little bit of biblical background here. And I just uh, briefly go to the very beginning of Scripture, Genesis chapter 1. <laughs> the creation story that we see in Genesis chapter 1 reads this way. 1-1. One, one. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So we see God, we see the heavens, we see the earth. We see the Lord calling into being uh, the heavens and the earth. God speaks existence into creation. Verse 3 says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. The Hebrew is very, very... Um, emphatic. And God said, light be, and light was. God spoke creation into existence, and he starts with light. The, the basis of creation is light, enlightenment. Light, speaking of goodness and blessing and truth and order and, and the Godhead and, and, and his steadfast love and his faithfulness. Light speaks of those things. But between verses 1 and 2, there's darkness. So there's we see God and we see light, but in between we see darkness. And here's how the darkness is, is described in verse 2. The earth was without form and void. In the Hebrew, the, the earth was waste and wild. There's this picture of chaos. And the, the chaotic element is further illustrated and darkness was over the face of the deep. Chaos is described in the beginning of the, God, uh, of the creation story, the narrative of the creation story in the beginning of Genesis, as a violent place of water. It's described as, a, as an ocean or a, or a sea or a lake in the midst of a terrible storm. So when we speak of, of the original image of, of chaos and disorder, the forces of darkness that God must bring into order under his command of let there be light, what we see is this waste and wild place. Is a, it's, a, it's a body of water uh, with a fierce raging storm taking place. And so, so this is a, a, a biblical image. It's not only a biblical image. Uh, all of the creation narratives of the ancient Near Eastern peoples have to do with the God fighting against the darkness, fighting against the chaos, fighting against the great sea monster, in order to establish order in the cosmos. That's, that's a common theme. And this is important because all through Scripture, where you see the Lord coming and calming the storm, the Lord coming and riding on the winds over the waters, the Lord walking on the water, it's a picture of Yahweh, the Lord God, the creator of all the universe, establishing order where there's darkness. So you see this picture of the disciples fighting the winds and fighting the waves and fighting the sea that wants to overwhelm them and overcome them is a picture of creation and its creation order. Now we also need to understand that in the ancient Near Eastern myths, <clears throat> The Hebrew word for the sea is yam, and the, the, the Ugaritic term for the god of the waters, who was a sea monster, is yam. And so, uh, in, in these ancient Near Eastern creation myths, the god that is going to establish himself as the most powerful god defeats the god of chaos, yam, the god of the sea. 
So this is the this is your Old Testament picture uh, behind the disciples fighting the winds and the waves on the sea, uh, on the Sea of Galilee. Back to Matthew 14. We, we want you to understand that because it's, it's, it's very important to what takes place and what occurs in this story. So back to Matthew 14, and I'll repeat uh, verse uh, 24. The boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, and the fourth watch of the night is late into the night, even moving into the early morning, which means they've been fighting this storm for a long time. This isn't a short storm. This isn't like a little thing that, uh, a little whirlwind that kind of turned up, a little uh, bit of wind that turned up for a short time. They found their way through it. They're fighting this all night. And, and so this, is, this has been a difficult situation. See, chaos is hindering their being obedient to Jesus. Jesus said, you guys go ahead. I'll meet up with you. I'm going to go pray. They're in obedience to Jesus. And so the picture is even greater. This, these forces of chaos are the forces of darkness. Demonic forces, if you will. Forces in, 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 in the world and in nature and in the cosmos and in, in, the, in, in human reality that oppose the disciples from fulfilling obedience to Jesus. But when the, uh, in the fourth watch of the night, he, that's Jesus, came to them walking on the sea. Again, using those terms, very important terms. I'm going to quote to you. Well, you can actually turn there. Uh, stay in Matthew 14, uh, at least mark it so you can get back there quickly. But I want to go to the book of Job. Book of Job, uh, chapter nine. I'm going to I'm going to read this particular passage uh, from the NIV, and it's just it's 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 talking about the Lord, uh, and Job says in chapter nine, and we'll pick it up with say verse um, five. He that's and of course uh, he is 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 God. He moves mountains without their knowing it and overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth from its place and makes its pillars tremble. The very pillars, the foundation of the cosmos he shakes and he overturns mountains. He speaks to the sun and it does not shine. He seals off the light of the stars. Verse 8, he alone, the Lord God, he alone stretches out the heavens and he treads on the waves of the sea. The Lord walks on the waters. This is a picture. Again, it's a, it goes back to that whole creation myth. The Lord walking on the waters means he has victory over the waters. He establishes chaos. He, uh, he, he, he disestablishes chaos by establishing his order. Walking on the waters means he has authority over the waters. Now, it's interesting when you read this in Hebrew. Remember, the Hebrew word for sea is yam, which is also the name of the chaotic, demonic, rebellious sea monster from the beginning before the Lord brought order by saying, let there be light. And to tread on the waves... Uh, the Hebrew word for waves can also be the Hebrew word for the back of something, like, you know, my back. So you could also translate this, he alone, the Lord, stretches out the heavens and he treads on the back of Yom. He treads on the back of the sea monster. He establishes his order as the greatest of all gods. Yahweh is the greatest of all gods. So back to Matthew 14. So, 1425, and in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to my uh, Greek interlinear at this point. I've been reading out of the ESV 
uh, for these passages. And of course, I read out of the NIV for Job chapter 9. But I want to go to my Greek here, the Greek New Testament, because we want to see what, what the Lord literally says here. Now, what you're going to see here is the, you know, you're going to see the problem with any kind of a translation. When we're going from one language to another, you're, we're trying to translate in a way that people get the sense in the context of the entire narrative. And we're trying to make it make sense in the language that uh, the readers possess. So we're trying to make it make sense in English. And it's okay, it's okay. that's, that's just a, a dimension of, of uh, translation called dynamic equivalency. We don't always translate things word for word. Now let me, let me read uh, what it says in the ESV and then let me kind of uh, bring the discussion of the narrative uh, and the, the dialogue that's taking place between Jesus and Simon Peter here and look at the what's literally being said. So the disciples see Jesus walking on the sea, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost, it's a phantasma, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a phantom. That's what they're saying. It's some kind of a specter. It's some kind of an apparition. I mean, obviously, this is some kind of a supernatural being because human beings don't walk on water. Our translations say it's a ghost, it's a phantasma. It is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. Now, that's giving you the sense. They see the Lord. The Lord reassures them and says, it lets them know that this is not a, a, a specter or an apparition or some kind of a ghost or spirit. This is Jesus. And then when he says who he is, then, then Peter has a discussion with him. Now, now let's go back to those verses and let's, let's just, just read um, this with, to see what is literally said here. Um, they see Jesus walking on the sea. And seeing him on the sea walking toward him, the disciples were troubled. And they said, it's a phantom. And they cried out in fear. But Jesus speaks to them. And this is what Jesus says. Jesus, first of all, says, be comforted. He says, I am. So what he says to them, Jesus says to them, take heart, be encouraged, be comforted, I am. And what he does is he uses the name of God that was revealed when Yahweh appeared to Moses. As he says in the Gospel of John before Abraham was, I am. That's what Jesus said to him, I am. And he's making a declaration of who he is. See, we said we're going to see the third aspect of Jesus' ministry. And the third aspect, Jesus heals and delivers. Jesus teaches and Jesus reveals who he is to his disciples. So Jesus says, I am, fear not. Which, of course, saying, I am with you, fear not, is a, a theme that runs from the Old Testament to the New Testament, which we're going to look at momentarily. He says, I am, fear not. And here's what Peter actually says to him. He says, if you are, command me to come out on the waters. In other words, he's saying, if you are, I am. If you really are the I am, the God who delivers his people out of Egypt, the God who created the universe. If you really are I am and you're walking on the water, see Peter is drawing on his, his Hebraic upbringing. And if you're really walking on the waters, if you're I am, then, then, then let me walk out on the waters with you. 
And we see here a kind of mini commissioning of the disciples. See, everything Jesus does, there's all these little mini commissionings. He's, he's by, by getting them to see who he really is, whether it's on the Mount of Transfiguration or miraculously feeding the 5,000, or, it's, or it's, it's walking on the waters declaring, I am, or it's simply going up into the mountains at night and praying to the Father, if it's healing the sick, if it's casting out devils, if it's teaching the Sermon on the Mount, if it's, if it's the Passover meal, the final meal with them, Jesus, these are many commissionings. He's constantly, bit by bit, slowly but slowly, showing the disciples who he is. And at this point, he's saying, if you're going to be my missionaries, if you're going to go on an apostolic mission for me, if you're going to be my prophets and my pastors and my teachers and my evangelists, then I'm inviting you to walk on the waters with me. And just as I subdue chaos, and that's when I subdue chaos, I bring light. I say light be and light was. And when I subdue chaos, I establish my kingdom. And when I subdue chaos, I proclaim the gospel. And when I subdue chaos, I'm prophesying. Then come on out on the waters. This is a, a mini commissioning. So Jesus says, come. Peter gets out of the boat, walks on the water, comes to Jesus but when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, again, the, the English translation, uh, it, it translates it as evocative. Evocative is an, uh, when you address somebody. I'm speaking to you. Oh, you of little faith. But actually, again, the literal... Greek right here is Jesus really calls Peter by a name here. It doesn't really say, oh, you of little faith. You isn't in there. It's just a name. And he says, little faith one, why did you doubt? He names Simon Peter, little faith one, one of little faith. And it isn't a rebuke here. Why? Because remember what Jesus said. He said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, if you are a little faith one, as opposed to one who doubts, one who doubts does not have faith. You, you, you can't have doubt and faith at the same time. Faith is a, a divine certainty, while doubt is, is a, a human uncertainty. Jesus said you just need to have a little bit of faith, mustard seed faith, and you can cast a mountain into the sea or a, or a, or a mulberry tree into the sea. Jesus is actually commending him. You had enough faith because you saw, you responded to I am. That's the source of your faith. Your faith wasn't something you worked up in you. You saw me and you heard me and I said, I am. And you said, if you are, I am, bid me come out. And he's giving us a mini commissioning here, a mini picturing of what it means to enter into apostolic ministry. And it means that if we have little faith and we walk on the water, when we do face chaos that overwhelms us. I mean, it, was, it was a big thing that Peter stepped out in faith in the midst of the chaotic storm. But at some point, the chaotic storm overwhelmed him. It didn't get better. It got worse. Do not assume that going forth in apostolic, prophetic authority, fivefold ministry authority means the storm gets any less. It just means you walk on the waters and you're able to proclaim the gospel in the midst of the storm. But here's what Jesus promises us. When we get out of the boat, and see, Teresa was talking about uh, we, we've, we've got to be free from our boundaries to really enter into the call 
that Jesus has for us. The boat speaks of our boundaries. It speaks of our limitations. She said that in the other occurrence of the storm, Jesus is asleep in the boat and they just move from one part of the boat to the other and they wake him up. That's, that's, that's kind of ministry in the house. But if we really want to have the apostolic ministry that Jesus is calling to, we're going to have to step out of those boundaries. And we step out of the boundaries, not because we close our eyes and say, I'm going to step out of the boundaries, I'm going to step out of the boundaries, I'm going to step out of the boundaries. And we, we, we conjure up, and that's a, that's a good word, conjure up this soul strength inside of us. No, we need to see Jesus walking on the waters. We need to see him say, I am, and then we say, if you are I am, bid me come, Lord. Now, of course, the key terminology is not only he says, I am, he says, fear not. When we see the I am, the I am calls us to fear not. And when we see the I am who calls us to fear not, it will be just as the Lord in Genesis 1 spoke creation into existence. In the midst of darkness, he said, light be. When we see I am and hear him saying, fear not, he speaks light into us and it enables us to get out of the boat. So we need to, we need to look to Jesus to get out of the boat. <clears throat> All right. Let's take a look at um, Genesis. We, we, we want to do a brief tour of fear not in Scripture. And uh, I'm getting uh, texted here that apparently we had, uh, maybe, maybe we had a little uh, example of uh, chaos. <laughs> uh, maybe we, we had a little example of some chaos appearing on our screen. So here's what we'll say. I don't I didn't see it and I'm not going to look at it, but cuz I'm going to continue. I'm going to continue uh ministering the word. We're going to step out of the boat, but we just say we bind uh whatever has shown up on the uh screen uh as not being of the Lord, but being of the chaos being of Yom, the sea monster. And we just say, we break the back of that sea monster in the name of Jesus. All right, brethren. Chapter 15 of Genesis. And we want you to see how the Lord, when he appears, is constantly saying to his people, fear not, I am with you. I am means I am with you. Genesis 15, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. God makes a covenant with Abram and says he's going to be the father of many nations. And when he does this, he appears to him saying, fear not, Abram. If we go next to Exodus chapter 14, and we're going to go through these relatively quickly. In Exodus 14, we know that the Lord has delivered or is in the process of delivering the children of Israel from Egypt. And after Pharaoh lets them go, he changes his mind and decides to come and get them back. And in Exodus uh, 14, verse 10, the armies of Pharaoh are seen in the near distance. The children of Israel who thought they were delivered come to the Red Sea. They see Pharaoh's armies coming. The sea is in front of them. Pharaoh's armies are behind them. Gee, Lord, I thought we were delivered. Gee, Lord, I thought I was walking on water. Well, we need to walk on water now. But when Pharaoh drew near in Exodus 14.10, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt 
that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not. So the Lord can speak to his people to say, Fear not. The apostolic and prophetic leader, who, by the way, is very fearful when God first calls him to lead the sons of Israel out of Egypt, now can rise up and tell the people what's been told him. Fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again, and the Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Moses says to fear not, and we know the Lord delivers them from Egypt. In the book of Joshua, in chapter 1, as Joshua is about to lead the people into the land, the Lord says in Joshua 1, 5, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you shall be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not fear, and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Go with me to Isaiah. And we see uh, in the book of Isaiah. Let's take a look at it. Let's just look at Isaiah 43. Actually, in Isaiah 41, 42, and 43. Um, 41, 42, and 43, uh, even though um, fear not is in all three of those passages, we're going to read just from 43. 43, 1, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame, and it shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba, in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you, I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, Give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And that's now a prophecy, and it's a return from the exile. Fear not. So whether it's it's departing from Egypt or coming into the land of their inheritance or being brought back from exile, the Lord uses language, fear not, I am with you. And, and, and he doesn't stop in the Old Testament. We know, first of all, in the New Testament here in Matthew 14, Jesus has said, fear not, I am with you. When he's walking on the waters. Take a look at in Acts chapter 18. Paul has established a great ministry 
in Ephesus and in Corinth. And he is, uh, at, this, at this point, it's just, it's Corinth. He's going to establish it in Ephesus, but he's becoming afraid of, of the pressures and the fears of, of persecution and retaliation in Acts 18. And Paul is, is, is considering potentially fleeing from Corinth. He's fled from some places before, and he had to flee for his life. I mean, we need to understand this thing about fear and courage. We need to understand about what it means to be uh, obedient to the Lord. Uh, the Lord can say, flee, just as easily as he can say, take a stand. The Lord can say, don't be afraid of COVID, move forward, and he can say, lock down, shut down, and live to fight another day. He can say, Paul, don't be afraid, go preach the gospel, and he can say, Paul, we got to let you down the walls of the city and get you out of this city. The issue of courage, courage is the courage to obey the voice of the Lord when he speaks to you. So Paul has heard the voice before, get out of Denver, but he's he's God's moving mightily with him in Corinth. And in the second half of verse 8 of Acts 18, many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent for I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you for I have many people in this city. Fear not. I'm with you. And finally, and this is just a small number of many occurrences, what we've been quoting the last three weeks, Revelation chapter 1. The Lord appears to John and is about to commission him to a new apostolic ministry that's going to have to face the beast and the false prophet and the great harlot. And Revelation 1, verse 17, Jesus appears John turns to see this glorious post-ascension having been established as king of the universe unveiling of Jesus. And in Revelation 1.17, John says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and the grave. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those things that are and those things that are about to take place after this and go address the seven churches and go prophesy and proclaim and move apostolically. So whether it's the Lord appearing to Abram it's a, an apostolic prophetic leader affirming the people to fear not. It's the angel of the Lord speaking to Joshua to take the land. It's, it's, it's a prophetic word that calls God's people to rise up out of Babylon and return to the land to rebuild the city and the temple. Whether it's Jesus walking on the water with his disciples, whether it's the Lord coming to Paul to tell him to stay where he's at and keep doing what he's doing, or it's the commissioning of a new level of apostolic ministry. The Lord's word is, fear not, I'm with you. Now let's go to the second part of the message. We're going to go to the call of Moses in Exodus 3. Exodus 3, this is the Lord appearing to Moses to commission him to go set his people free. And it is a revelation of I am. All commissionings, calls, sending forth uh, on apostolic missions, are always preceded by a revelation of who the Lord really is. And that empowers us. That's what causes us to walk on the water. You don't get faith by somehow trying to generate it in yourself. You get faith by seeing the Lord. You can see the Lord in Scripture. You can see the Lord 
as he reveals himself to you. You can see the Lord in your brothers and sisters in Christ, but we need to see a fresh vision of the Lord to move where he would have us. So just as we have a mini commissioning in Matthew 14 of the disciples seeing who Jesus is, we're going to have a major commissioning here of Moses. Now we understand the story in Exodus. Moses at 40 years old is this powerful, mighty man of justice. He's going to set his people free. He's going to remove the oppression from them. He's going to deal with all the systemic racial issues. He's going to set his people free from slavery. And of course, we know what happens is he ends up running. He starts off his mission powerfully and mightily. But see, he hasn't been commissioned by I am yet. So he's trying to fulfill the mission on his terms. This is something we always have to deal with as Christians. We can see the mission in Scripture and seek to go fulfill it on our own terms. Or we can see the mission in Scripture and look for the Lord to reveal himself to us and then commission us in his power and his strength, not in our own zeal. And we walk on water when the second thing takes place. When the first thing takes place, we run in fear, hiding from the authorities. So at 40, he's going to deliver his people. We find him here now at 80, 40 years later, he's been in the wilderness shepherding sheep. One of the most humiliating, one of the most humbling exercises a, a, a man can uh, embrace. But we, we recognize that before honor, there is humility. There is a cross before a crown. There's death before resurrection. And when, when God really empowers his people and how God really empowers his people to walk on waters is, is, is he breaks us of our own natural strength, our own natural tendency. See, brokenness is a key aspect to discipleship. It's just like Jan mentioned the story of Jacob. You know, Jacob, Jacob stole the birthright from Esau. Jacob had all the plans on how he was going to establish God's kingdom his way. I mean, he'd, he'd, he'd had a, 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 an initial calling from the Lord, but he was doing it in his own strength, in his own cunning, in his own wit, in his own wisdom, in his own giftedness. And he meets the Lord on the way back home from bringing his wives and children and family and inheritance back from the land that he was sent by his father Isaac and he's returning to his homeland. And of course, he wrestles with the Lord and the Lord breaks his hip. The Lord can break the hip of a Jacob. He can let a Moses be out 40 years uh, in the wilderness shepherding sheep and he can have his main disciples betray him on the night that he's crucified, but he finds a way to break them. He can allow his powerful apostle Paul to have this demon that afflicts him, which uh, Pastor Rob mentioned in worship, and he cries out, let this, let this demon depart from me. And the Lord says, it's just fine. Things are fine the way they are. Uh, my grace is sufficient for you. See, brokenness figures into apostolic commissioning. So Moses is keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There's something particular about this place. It's called the mountain of God. Mountains are, were always places where the deities descended from heaven and met with human beings. This is a foreshadowing of the fact that, that the Lord is going to, when he leads the sons of Israel out of Egypt, he's going to descend on Mount Sinai and he's going to rend the heavens. He's going to come down from heaven and he's going to make a covenant with his people. So the mountains speak of the place where the divine and the human meet. And God establishes covenants and relationships with his people. So Moses is in the wilderness for 40 years. He's a humble shepherd, very humble um, profession. 
and he's on Horeb, the mountain of God. Isn't that amazing? In, in his humiliation, he's actually brought to the place where God dwells on this mountain. And I want you to see the series of, of images here, the, the, the names and the titles of the deity. First of all, the deity is called the angel of Yahweh. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. Now, you see, we have an out-of-boundary kind of reality here, okay? You certainly had an out-of-boundary reality to see Jesus walking on the water, a human being a God-man, but a human being walking on the water. That's an out-of-boundary situation. This is how what the Lord does. When he reveals himself to us, he parts the heavens. And there's this disruption of the divide between the earthly and the heavenly, and we get a glimpse into the Lord who he really is. While well, seeing a bush that's on fire, and yet the bush isn't consumed, and oh, by the way, the bush is talking, well, that's an out-of-boundary experience. This is what the Lord does when he reveals himself to us. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, Yahweh turned aside. When Yahweh saw that, excuse me, when Yahweh saw that Moses turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Moses is identifying, I am here. And now the Lord is going to reveal to him, well, I am here. It's this, this parallel of, of two I ams, the human I am and the divine I am, just, just as it was with Peter. Now notice, I want you to see, you have to understand in the narrative, in the early parts of Genesis, the Lord reveals himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as Yahweh. That's the special covenant relational name of God. He's Elohim. He's God to the entire universe. God spoke the universe into existence in Genesis 1. He's the God over all the universe, but he's Yahweh in relationship to his people. It's a, it's a covenant term. It's a family term. It's a term of intimacy. It's a term of relationship. But what happens when the sons of Israel go into Egypt and they, they were there in Egypt for several hundred years, you don't see the name Yahweh being used. When the, the, the divinity is addressed, he's addressed as Elohim, he's addressed as God. But now there's going to be this fresh revelation of Yahweh once again. It's Jesus saying, I am. So we see that he's God, he's called God here, he's called the angel of Yahweh, that's Jesus in his Old Testament appearance. You actually have Father, Son, and Spirit here. The angel of the Lord is the one who's in the bush, but the voice is the voice of Yahweh, and we're actually going to see the Holy Spirit invisible as he is later on in this chapter. There's a proto-Trinitarian revelation here. It means the Jews may not have believed in a triune God the way we as Christians do, but all the all the parts are there. All the elements are there. So we see him as God. We see him as the angel of the Lord. We also see him as Yahweh. Yahweh turns when Moses turns to listen to him, but, but God calls to him out of the bush. He's, he's all these things. He's, he's God to Moses, and he's God to the children of Israel, but he wants to become Yahweh once again, as he was with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when he made the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then the Lord said, uh, he said in verse 5, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Now see, when we, when we are confronted with the divine, we have to get out of our comfort zone. We've got to get out of our boundaries. Just as Peter had to get out of the boat, Moses has to get out of his shoes because of the holiness. The holiness of God is his otherness. You are about to experience something you've never experienced in your life. And we need to understand that all those mini commissionings that the disciples were having as they're gradually seeing Jesus more and more clearly, they, they are 
out of boundary experiences. The Lord does many out of boundary experiences with us. He reveals to us who he is and he takes us places we've never gone. That's not like a once for all thing in, in, in our lives. Oh, once I was born again, or once I was baptized in the spirit, or once I was in the Jesus movement revival. Our entire lives are series of the Lord taking us places where we've never gone. So he announces himself to Moses. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So first of all, he reaffirms the covenant he made with Abraham. Remember we said everything Jesus does, uh, everything God does, it's covenant renewal. It's the covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is now going to be renewed with the sons of Israel. And then the covenant he made with the sons of Israel, he's going to remake it with David. And then the covenant he remade with David, he's going to renew it once again in the new covenant. And then he's going to appear in the book of Revelation. And once again, it's always covenant renewal. It's the Lord taking what's already in place and bringing it forth in a new, fresh, powerful way. Church, please hear me. Do you understand? I'm saying the same thing week after week after week. The Lord is about to do something new in our midst. There's going to be a new song. And why should that be anything unexpected? How many times has he done new things with us over the course of our lives? And for you young believers, man, what a time to be alive. For you young people who are following Jesus, what a time to be alive. Because, man, the Lord is going to take you on a journey at, at a certain point in time. We're going to be out of here. We're going to get our last covenant renewal experience uh, but you've got what a time to be alive be of good cheer be encouraged anticipate expect see that's what hope is faith hope and love hope is i have divine expectations god is going to do something powerful in my day and age moses hid his faith face for he was afraid to look at god look at the one who's going to appear to him in moses's mind is god elohim but he needs to see Yahweh. Then the Lord said, Yahweh said, see, see, Yahweh's speaking and God is speaking. Elohim speaking, Yahweh is speaking. The same person is speaking to Moses. Moses is perceiving him as Elohim, but he's Yahweh and that's who he wants to reveal himself. Whoever Jesus is today speaking to you, he wants to reveal himself even in a greater way. It's still going to be Jesus. God is Yahweh and Yahweh is God, but it's going to be something deeper, powerful, more wonderful. And Yahweh said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. And see, here's where he's moving from God to Yahweh. Yahweh is the God who sees his people's affliction. Yahweh is the God who hears his people cry. Yahweh is the God who takes issue with those who oppress his people. Yahweh is the one who isn't just going to reveal himself in his personal presence. He is, but he's going to deliver them. He's going to do something mighty for them, and he's going to break the power of chaos. He's going to break the back of the sea dragon. He's going to break the back of Egypt. By the way, you know Egypt's symbolic name in scripture is Rahab. And you know what Rahab is? A sea monster. Okay. He's going to break the back. See, this is this is this is this sets the whole backdrop to Jesus walking on the water. Oh yeah, Yahweh did this in the Old Testament. He broke the back of the sea monster 
Egypt and set us free. You mean, Jesus, you're the I am, and now you're going to break the back of the sea monster that is oppressing your people? Yes and yes. He's not just going to deliver them out from somewhere. He's going to bring them into something. Deliverance and blessing. And it's going to be a place of blessing and prosperity. And as Yahweh, he identifies with the cry of his people. As Yahweh, he recognizes false political structures, the Pharaoh spirit, the Pharaoh reality that just oppresses people and feeds its own belly on that oppression. He is going to break that power. And then he says in verse 10, Come, I will send you. I will send you. And see, that's the Hebrew word shalach. And shalach is the Hebrew word that corresponds to apostello in the Greek. Shalach and apostello, I'm going to send you on a mission. Moses is actually experiencing an apostolic call. We know that Moses is called a prophet, but his call is not a call to be a prophet. It's a call to be an apostle, to, to be the apostle, as the Lord reveals himself and accomplishes these things. In fact, seven times in the remainder of Exodus 3, we're going to see this Hebrew word shalach. I've sent you, I've sent you, I've sent you. And we need to understand this is an apostolic commission. Commissioning, not any different from the commissioning of the disciples when Jesus was raised from the dead, not any different from the call of Paul in Acts chapter 9, and not any different from Revelation chapter 1 when Jesus appears to John for the Revelation 1 apostolic call. He says, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And what this marks is the Lord is going to move sovereignly, but man is going to be a co-laborer with God. God could do this all by himself, and most of it he does. He does most of it by himself. But now man is going to be part of it. And see, that's what real apostolic ministry is. It's that the Lord includes human beings in his missional plan and purpose to bring the gospel to the nations of the earth and to liberate the earth. But Moses said to God, see, he's still talking to him as God. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Did, did, didn't you remember 40 years ago, Lord? I tried this. I, we tried this once. God didn't work. See, when God breaks us, he, he also has to restore us from the breaking. He breaks us to get us to where we don't trust in ourselves, but he has to reestablish us to where we, not trusting in ourselves, trust in the Lord. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you. Fear not, I am with you. Now, I will be and I am, it's the same verb in Hebrew, whether God says, I am that I am, or that verb is parsed and translated, I will be what I will be. When the Lord actually announces his name, all of those different aspects of the name Yahweh come from the verb to be. I will be with you. This is the beginning of him saying, Moses, step out from just seeing me as God and see me first of all. And we're going to say, we're gonna, he's going to see him this way, that way, and this way. And we want you to see the bigness of God's revelation of himself. And this is how he calls people into the apostolic ministry and how he commissions peoples for apostolic mission. So first of all, he says, well, first of all, it's not God who's going to be sending you. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Well, it's not even anything to be about who you are. It's who I am, and it's I will be with you. So first of all, the revelation of Yahweh is a God who is with you. Fear not. And this shall be the sign for you. He's a God of signs. 
He's a God who confirms that he's with his people with signs and wonders. Signs and wonders, all we've said, signs and wonders is God bearing witness to your bearing witness to him. When you do what God calls you to do, he will supply the signs and wonders you need that you are backed by Yahweh. That you have the God of the universe with you on this mission to fulfill it. I will be with you and this shall be the sign for you that I have again sent you. There's a second occurrence. I'm sending you. Shalak, apostello. I'm sending you on an apostolic mission. This is a sign that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And to serve God on the mountain, to serve God on the mountain is to worship God. The, wor the Hebrew word for serve and the Hebrew word for worship are similar words at this point. So what's going to be the sign? Sign, is it going to be that God's with you with his presence? Yes. Is it that God's going to deliver you from Egypt? Yes. Is it that God's going to bring you to the mountain to worship him? Yes. The sign is all three things. The presence of the Lord that accomplishes what he sends you out to do and in the midst of doing what he's called you to do and at the end of doing what he's called you to do, you worship the Lord. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, and notice, he's still with God. The God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? So Moses even understands from deep within his, his own cultural consciousness that, that the God that raised up Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob wasn't Elohim. He had a name. He had a personal, intimate name. And see, Moses is, isn't asking a question necessary out of ignorance. One thing you find out about Moses is he asks God the right questions. He asks God spirit-ordained, spirit-birthed questions. He asks God questions to always see if the favor of God is truly with him. And even at the start, when he's afraid, he's upset, he's concerned, he has no confidence in this, he begins to ask the right questions. Well, who is this? Who are you? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say to this people, I am sent me to you. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So he's saying, I will be with you. I am that I am. And I am has sent me to you. And again, he mentions the word for an apostolic call and an apostolic mission. Now, the verb to be that is in the phrase, I am that I am, can be translated, I am that I am. It could be equally translated as, I will be who I will be. It could equally be translated, I cause to happen what I cause to happen. And he's saying a number of things to Moses here. First of all, he's saying, I am doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who Egypt is. I am. I'm the self-existent one. I am the Lord who calmed the chaos in Genesis 1. I am the one who broke the sea monsters back. I am the chief of all gods. I am. I will be who I will be can mean, and by the way, whoever you need me to be, I will be. And the third translation, I will cause to happen what will, I will cause to happen means, and by the way, I'm not just promising you my presence. I'm going to do what I say. I am a God who, when he promises, I fulfill those promises. See, the Hebrew word Yahweh can mean the God who makes things happen, the one who makes things happen. Yahweh actually, when Yahweh constantly reveals himself, I'm Yahweh, I'm God, I'm Lord, there's no other. He's basically saying, I'm the God who makes things happen. 
No other gods make things happen. I make things happen. So this is an incredible revelation of who the Lord is. Oh, and by the way, when Jesus said, I am, fear not, he was going back to their whole, the disciples' whole understanding of Exodus 3. Verse 15, God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, now he gets, now he says, I am that I am, but he gets Yahweh into it. That's who I am is. This is Yahweh. This is the God that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew, but you guys have kind of lost in all these years of oppression, in all these years of slavery. See, we lose who the Lord is when we are oppressed. Whatever that oppression is, from the, the, the overt oppression in the nations who are being persecuted for the sake of the gospel to, to internal oppression in nations that are supposedly free but are oppressed by materialism and sensuality and consumerism, to the poor who are oppressed by the wealthy, the elite, the entitled, the political power brokers in both parties, by the way. And by the way, they're good people in both parties, by the way. Those good people are godly and righteous people. And they need to understand that they're there as salt and light to transform what is nothing more than a human institution. People who are oppressed because their rights are taken from them. Whether they are people who are alive and have their rights taken from them, and babies who are unborn and have their lives and rights taken from them. Oppression makes us forget the Lord. Now this is a nation that has been enslaved for centuries. They remember him as God. They don't remember him as Yahweh, but Yahweh is about to send forth an apostolic leader who's going to raise up an apostolic team and he's going to move powerfully on their behalf and he's going to reveal himself as Yahweh. Say to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has again sent me to you. I'm renewing the covenant. I made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it may look after these hundreds of years of slavery like I forgot about that covenant, but I haven't. And though my people have forgotten who Yahweh is, and you only have a, a brain fog, Moses, a, a brain frog remembrance of who I am, I am about to reveal myself as in Matthew 14, as in Acts chapter 18, as in Revelation chapter 1, as in Joshua chapter 1. I'm about to renew my covenant. Lord, renew your covenant with your church. May we see Jesus, who is I am, fear not in this hour. God, you got to raise this church up. Father, I say, I declare, the church in America is pathetic because of its trust in man, because of its trust in a way of life, because of its trust in a nation, because of its trust in politics, Lord. I thank you for those brothers and sisters who even now, as we speak, are being faithful to your call. They're not pathetic, Lord. But so many of us, Lord, we need I am to rise up and renew the covenant and unveil Jesus in a fresh new way. Walk on the waters and bid us to come out of the boat and walk on the waters. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, Go to the leaders. Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, 
the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey, and they will listen to your voice. And the elders, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews. See, he's identifying completely with his people. Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go a three days journey in the wilderness that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God. He's not just God anymore. He's Yahweh our God. And see, what were they to request of Pharaoh? Well, we want to go worship our God in the wilderness. And that's what Pharaoh was, was, was being asked. We want to go out and worship. And that's what Pharaoh said, no, you can't worship. See, when the powers that be, the political powers that be, say you cannot worship your God anymore, you, the powers that be cross a line. Okay, They cross a line, and when they cross a line, Yahweh rises up to deliver his people. Do it, O Lord, in the earth, in the name of Jesus. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. And he's letting them know, don't be discouraged. If he says no, he's going to say no. But his no versus my right hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. And after that, he will let you go. Now I said seven times the word to be sent apostolically, shalach, or apostello in the Greek version of this passage. Five times it's already been mentioned in verses 10 through 15 where the Lord specifically said, I will send you. Now see, this is how apostolic mission works. The Lord commissions an apostle to be sent on a mission. But the Lord doesn't send him alone. Where it says here, verse 20 has the sixth and seventh time of the Hebrew word shalach. And it says in verse 20, I will stretch out my hand. I will send out my hand. My hand will go with you apostolically. And what did Irenaeus say? I said that a couple weeks ago in the teaching. Irenaeus, early church father, said, the two hands of the Lord are Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The angel of the Lord speaks out of the bush to begin. There's the son. Yahweh speaks to Moses, there's the Father, and then the hand of the Lord is going to be sent. That's the Spirit, the Spirit, Father, Son, and Spirit. It's a triune activity raising up apostolic ministry for the people of God to move powerfully and mightily. And where's the seventh occurrence of being sent? Same verse. So I will send out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it, and afterward Pharaoh will send you out. And this is how apostolic mission always works. Apostolic men and women raised up, the Holy Spirit going along for the sending, and even the very powers that oppose God's work of the gospel, they end up participating in the apostolic call by sending them out. And how does Pharaoh participate? Not willingly, but by the mighty persuasive arm of the Lord. This is how he does this. He will send you out, and we close in verse 21 and 22, and I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and when you go, you'll not go empty, but each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry for clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and your daughters, so shall you plunder the Egyptians. Pharaoh's going to send them out by restitution. See, the Lord is sending them out. He doesn't just deliver them out of Egypt. Egypt has gotten free labor from the sons of Israel for centuries. They stole work. And the Lord's just saying, oh, and by the way, you're going to get back pay. You're going to get back pay for the centuries. That's restitution. Let's pray for God to deliver his people with restitution. So, Father, we come before your throne in the name of Jesus. I thank you for Teresa 
who set this in motion. I pray that this word will go forth mightily and powerfully in the midst of your people. I pray, Lord, that you will accomplish these things in our midst. We want to see I am. And what we're going to say, Lord, is if you are I am, Lord, bid us come out of the boat. May this happen. May it happen soon, but may it happen in your time according to your purposes that the mission might be established in our midst. In Jesus' name. And P.S., for the nonsense that came out of, came up on the screen today, we just say, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. God bless you, brethren. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.